Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhaj. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Roxanne. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, this week, I have a special colleague um, that I had the privilege of um, meeting in uh, New York last December. Her name is April Lewis. Hi, April. How are you today? Hello, Roxanne. I'm well. How are you? Good. You're a busy lady. She was speaking this morning, and now has kind of eked out an hour out of her time to be able to spend this time with us today. Um, April and I met, actually, we both were privileged uh, to share the stage with Les Brown in New York um, at the Get Hungry conference um, in Long Island, where it was a privilege to be able to um, spend that time with her. And she has done an ama- lots of amazing things, and we have a lot more commonality than I had uh, recognized until just recently, where I took the time to really look at her website and and listen to her speaking um, on her website, which you need to check out. So I'm just going to read a bit of a bio on April and April's going to share with you the things that maybe are most important that maybe I've missed. So April's a highly sought out transformational speaker and a corporate wellness trainer. Uh, She's founded the Lewis Academy for Wellbeing, uh, where professionals learn proven principles to enhance quality of life, productivity, and improve effectiveness. Uh, she, her background is varied. She's, as a student, um, she's been a professional athlete. She's a veteran, which is a powerful story when I've heard her story on stage. Um, and she positioned herself as a change in, agent in the wellness and mental health industry, the same industry that I'm in. She works with entrepreneurs and corporations to gain clarity and focus while helping them establish and set necessary goals for progression. She's all about movement. Uh, She provides fundamental tools to overcome any mental barriers, which we all have them periodically, uh, that may get in the way of uh, enhanced productivity and decreased performance. She is also a best-selling author of the book, The Missing Peace in Forgiveness, Overcoming the the Impossible. I was going to say the obstacle, the impossible. And where, where... you know, the story that she shared that I heard is when she lost um, her husband um, while they were serving their country and all the unfortunate things that comes from, you know, serving uh, in, in the armed forces. So, April, I haven't done all of this justice, but um, what an impressive uh, biography. Thank you very much, Rock Band. Thank you. That the uh, uh, it up. <laughs> so, is there anything that I, I haven't read? I know I haven't read everything. Anything that you think that uh, the listeners should, should know about you uh, that I haven't shared in your bio? Um, well, the main thing is what you said. I do. My specialty is mental health. I work with individuals and organizations to break down the mental barriers that keep in the workforce or the individual from being a high performer. And the way I do that is really doing assessment, understanding where they are in contrast to where they want to be. And it's simplifying the process to get there. Most of the time, people don't take steps, don't take that very next step because they're overthinking everything. They have a lot of noise in their head or the fears that are in their head, the doubt that's in their head. But once you gain clarity, which you mentioned, on where you want to go, all you have to do next is determine what's the next thing I need to do. When you're kind of transform your life, transform your performance, you can't eat the elephant in its entirety. You eat it one bite at a time. So I work with people and I work with corporate executive teams doing that, just that. What is the very next step that we can take to get to where we want to be and how we want to be there? Now, you have been through um, massive things, I'm going to say, um, from remembering your story. So I... I, I, w- I want you to share that because that's, you know, April, I followed April on stage, which was not a good thing. <laughs> um, and, uh, but be, just being captivated by her story because she's been there. She's been there in every realm. 
and uh, now has come out the other side and being able to share this with the world. Tell them a bit about your story, April, because I, you know, I was struck um, just listening to you and kind of where you were, where you got to, and how you came out the other side, and how that kind of informs what you do today with uh, with executives. Absolutely. Um, well, one of the things that I live by, one of the statements that I live by, rather, is that we teach best what we most often need to learn. And the reason I found myself in mental health is because that is where I was after I got a phone call that changed the trajectory of my life. That phone call came in on February the 27th, 2006, when I got the call that my husband had been killed in Iraq. At the time, both of us were in the military. We both were serving our country. And he was serving it in the capacity that he absolutely wanted to, to be an infantryman, a frontliner for the United States Army. And with that calling that he answered, he was no longer here after February the 27th. That day is what I call the day that I died, but the day that I started living. And in the book that I wrote, the one that you mentioned, The Missing Peace and Forgiveness, is I titled it, um, my segment, Life After Death. Because if it were not for that tragedy, I would not have started my life, found my voice to do the work that I'm doing now. After Dwayne transitioned, I completely lost my mind. I, you work with a lot of patients with PTSD. I'm still battling through PTSD personally. I went on a spiral downward that I didn't even know was possible. Um, as smart as I was, the strongest I was, every, being in the Army, you know it's part of the, the job, air quotes, but you don't get ready to get that phone call. You don't get ready to hear that your first love is no longer with you. And I just went downhill. I completely lost my faith. I came addicted to drugs. My behavior was dysfunctional. I was insanely angry. I was angry at myself. I was angry at my husband. I was angry at God. I was angry at anyone that looked happy because I was so miserable and so broken. And in that brokenness, it took me nine years to realize that I'm not going to be here forever. And in those nine years, I was completely functional on the outside. A few people knew the depth of my pain and the depth of my sorrow. Most of them were my friends. I was in North Carolina at Fort Bragg at the time. But my family didn't even know how destructive my lifestyle had become because I was so hurt. And in those nine years, I just inched my way through the day. I put the mask on. I was a high performer. You know, I didn't let anybody see my weak side. And then I moved to South Carolina to start over. And in that move, I ended up on the campus, uh, Midlands, Midlands Technical College. And I went in the human services program. And that was in 2007 when I started my healing. In 2016, when I released my story in a book, is when I can say that I was healed. It's now 2018, and I can say that I'm whole. Because you know there are stages to grieving. And there is no order for those stages. There is no time limit for how long you'll be in one. And some of them may come back if you don't work all the way through them. So that's why mental health is so near and dear to my heart. Because when I lost my mind, when I lost my ability to focus, when I lost my ability to make sound decisions for myself, but knew that I still wanted to be here. And I'll stop right there and say, me wanting to be here. I had suicidal thoughts like a lot of people that go through a state of grieving. There was this one time I was sitting on the side of my bed and I thought about killing myself. And when I had that thought, I felt a sense of relief. And you probably heard it from your clients. When they think about it before they act on it, it feels like that's the answer. If I leave here, I won't feel any pain. Well, I had that feeling. And then the very next thought that came across my mind was the image or the image, not even a thought. I saw my mom leaned over my casket. And through that vision that I say God gave me, I snapped out of it. Because my love for my mother was stronger than my desire to kill myself. And that's what kept me in the game. And I said, April, if you're going to be here, you have got to get your life back. So I started my personal transformation step by step. It would have been beautiful if I could have transformed the whole April Lewis and come with back to that state of happiness and joy. But she was no longer here. She was now a broken widow dealing with survivor's guilt, dealing with addiction, dealing with anger, and now dealing with PTSD. So step by step, I started my mental transformation. And it honestly has been a journey. It's a journey that I'm still on, but it's a journey that now I go through it in gratitude because I know that I've come so very far 
And as long as I stay present in the moment and keep my thoughts clear and positive, I can get through anything. Wow. You know, I, in my tenure, have dealt with a lot of people with, uh, with complex PTSD. And the first thing is just having them know that they survived, Mm -hmm. right? Like, like you're breathing, you're seeing, you're hearing some basic, basic things, right? Because oftentimes people are so stuck with every possible symptom there is, Mm -hmm. right? Right. And they want to quiet the white noise, which is basically what you were saying, because it becomes so overwhelming that you can't even hear your own voice. Yeah right? Which is kind of what you're describing. And it, it takes so much um, strength, but I, I, I'm going to ask you this question because I can tell you what I've experienced, but I want to honor what you're sharing. Connection is key through it, but oftentimes people feel so um, alone that they recreate aloneness instead of leaning towards connection they kind of step away and they, they, they kind of, you know, literally fold up in their body language. What helped you that, that vision of your mother? Wow. How powerful. And I, you know, I often say it's something bigger than you and I always. Um, Did you cut out people in your life at that time? Oh yes. I became so isolated. I, I knew then that I could no longer serve because my mind was too far gone. So my military career had to end at that moment. I became distant from anybody that was happy because in my misery, I didn't want to see it. In my misery, I thought that it was temporary. I, you know, I even changed the license plate on my car to say one life, why not? Because when I sat there and I leaned over the casket and I'm looking at Dwayne and I'm looking at this man who we have all these unspoken words and that we'll never get to save with each other. I literally asked myself, what does it matter? What does any of this matter? If this is where we're going to end up, what's the point? I was mad, and I did not want to be around anybody. And what I did, I started connecting with people who were operating in the same state of mind that I was operating in, so people who were just at a low vibrational frequency at that stage in their life. I wasn't around anybody that was speaking positively. I wasn't around anybody that was uplifting. I knew that's where I should have been, but I didn't want to be there because I was anchored in anger, you know, and I was and even in that the victim mindset, people say that, oh, don't have a victim mindset. But at that moment, I was a victim. At any given moment, we are a victim. The thing is not always staying in that place, realizing how can you be victorious after you've been a victim to something either that you've done to yourself or something that um, someone else did to you. So, yes, I definitely isolated myself. I did not connect with my spiritual leaders. I wasn't as close with my family. I was around a group of people that let me have that moment. They didn't think about bringing me out of that moment, but they let me have it. But for the most part, I was by myself, which is the worst place that you can be when you're grieving. Because like you said, the white noise gets louder. Mm -hmm. The conversations that you have with yourself get louder. So connectedness is critical. Now, I realize more than ever, even if it's just one person, you need to be connected to someone that's going to recognize when you're down and stay with you and help you pull yourself up. And the people that you probably, I'm going to assume, and I'm just talking from what has been shared with me, they connected to something that maybe was also pain related and they weren't seeing as clear. So I'm just thinking when you shared, they probably didn't give you any clarity. They probably just said, yeah, you're, you're right where you need to be. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. The, it, the air quote advice that I was getting from people was nothing that I needed. People do the best that they can, but honestly, my family, you think about it, we would hear on the news hundreds and hundreds of soldiers that are getting killed. We heard it. I remember I was in the army at the time. I remember 9-11 like it was yesterday. One reason is that that's my husband's birthday. So on his birthday, we were sitting in the barracks at Fort Lee, Virginia, and all he was talking about and thinking about was going to war so he can get them, right? That's what he was saying. And who knows how to respond when someone, a 20-something year old said, oh, my husband has been killed in Iraq. There are over 3,000 fallen soldiers from Operation Iraqi Freedom. 
And it's still baffling to me and other people that my Dwayne was one of the 3,000. So it's, it's a hard thing to try to cope with. And for someone to be a friend of, you know, the victim at that time, they just don't know what to say. So you allow, it just allowed me to be in that state of pain. Now at the time, I don't have any regrets. So I don't have any regrets because I wasn't ready to come out of it. But looking back, I wish that I would have chosen to save myself sooner. You know, um, I don't, I don't believe that we go through anything just for the sake of going through it. So I even hate to say that I wish, but you know, if I, if I can work with anybody or say something to someone who may, God forbid, lose their spouse or lose someone close, the sooner you can get to connect to someone that's going to speak positively and speak life and you and help you heal, the better. Because I did not attempt to heal. I just self-medicated by saying hi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to connect when you're high, right? Because you might, you might think the thoughts and you might want to feel better. And then you think, well, oh, here comes a bad thought or here comes a bad emotion. Let me take that, you know, whatever that is to make me feel better. And then before you know it, you're in an altered state and then you go through the same cycle again. So somewhere in there, it has to be a crevice or a crack of some sort um, that, you know, says, hey, there's something different. So when, when, what was that sliver that helped you start to recognize, okay, April, like you said, I'm a victim. I felt all these things. They're real. I'm a 27 year old or 20 something year old that doesn't have a husband. I've given to this country, which is a, you know, what a service thing that you both did. Something happened that made you come out of it. What was it? <laughs> Ironically enough, it, there wasn't a true pinpointed defining moment, but what let me know that I was going to be okay was when I was able to get out of bed in the morning consistently. Okay. The bed, Jim Rohn called it the battle of the mattress. A lot of people struggle with waking up in the morning because it's just bad habit or you're not looking forward to the day. It was truly how my distaste for the new day manifested itself. I did not want to get out of bed. And when I found myself able to set my alarm clock for a certain, a certain time, and I was able to get up and actually start my day, and when I looked back and saw that I was doing it, that let me know, April, you're on the right path. You are absolutely healing. So it wasn't a one hit, boom, this person said this or this activity. It was when I realized that I was getting out of bed, which means that I was telling the day that I'm still here. And I'm not going to give up on myself. I'm going to keep going. And even this morning, I shared in my speaking engagement, I started making sure I made my bed up every single morning. Because what I had to do was tell myself that you are no longer resting. You are no longer sleeping. You are now in this day. So I am religious about making my bed up. Now, there are for crazy days that happen when I don't. But it, I'm about 99.8% you know, positive hit on making my bed up every day because that little thing right there catapulted me into my transformation. Isn't that interesting? I was just hearing that um, recently. I think it was James Quick or somebody that talked about that, right? Because the context of rituals are so key, right? Because, of course, when you're in that deep space, you know, anxiety, depression, you know, suicidality, you know, anything that because those are real the body and the brain is trying to process yes. all that stuff and it's like i often say my analogy and i don't know if this makes sense april is it's kind of like if you had a piece of food stuck in your throat right now didn't matter what i was saying you're not going to be able to do anything until you clear that piece of food that's right i, I use emotional uh, you know trauma or or uh, post-traumatic stress or grief like that is I can't hear the a damn thing you're saying because I'm stuck. Clear me first. And then that I is, hear. Yes, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that is the perfect analogy. You cannot, which is why when I'm working with people and I'm working with organizations, it sounds good to say, oh, I'm going to increase your bottom line and oh, I can help you do this. And I will get you there. But the key is the blockage. What's stopping your organization and what's stopping you from going from where you are to where you desire to be is what's stuck, like you said, stuck in your throat. What is it in your mindset that's keeping you here and keeping you from hearing? 
from other people and keeping you because people who are broken, we often look out looking for answers. Like me, people always ask me, how do you have so much wisdom? How do you have so much this? Well, in my quest to heal myself, if anybody wrote a book or did a video or did a speech that said that they can help me, I listen, I read, I listen to podcasts. I went out seeking the answer that would get me out of that darkness. And it led me back to myself. Mm -hmm. The journey of going outward, looking for everything, I ultimately had to come back in and forgive myself. I had to come back in and fall back in love with myself. I had to come back in and set a vision for my life and then surface to the outside world. Absolutely. And it's, you know, when you're, when you're in that slippery slope, it's hard to see even a small thing like making your bed. Yes. Oh, God, yes. That's like moving <laughs> right. a mountain when you're depressed. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, you know, and then when you get into that small ritual, like the first time you open your eyes, right, to the first couple of minutes are so key. And, you know, when you hear about it, if you think about it in the military, what is it that they make you do? Make that bed. Make that damn bed. I don't care what's make going on with you. Yeah. And you do the very best you can do. Um, and because that sets the context for what I'm going to do, I am capable of something. And then one thing leads to another leads to another. And if you kind of think about a lot of us, right, you know, what is the first thing we do? We use our phones as alarm clocks. Not a good idea, right? Get an alarm clock or put it in the other room. Right. And yeah. then we check things. We, we, all of a sudden we check it so that our day already starts to get run by other people versus kind of setting the context of small little steps that you can do make your bed you know pray meditate you know whatever it is to be able to set that stage for i'm capable of doing these basic things mm -hmm. and then it becomes easier day by day it's not an epiphany like you said it wasn't anything huge other mm -hmm. than i do this damn thing I'm, and i'm on my way absolutely and i love the word that you said that i'm capable of doing that because when you're down, and for anybody that's listening to this right now who may feel like they aren't going to come out the place that they're in, it doesn't have to be as tragic as losing your husband. I lost my dog January 24th this year, 2018, and I was in my bed for five days. For five days, I could not get out of my bed. I could not eat. I did not wash myself. All I could do was sit there and look at every picture and every video that I had of this sweet poodle. She was with me for 11 years. I got her right after Dwayne. So you see that opened up a wound all over again. And so the, are you capable to do something as simple as making your bed? Open up your blinds in the morning. I open up the blinds in the windows when I start my day. Are you capable to pick up the phone and call someone and say, hey, I'm going through right now. I don't even know how to put this in words, but if you can just talk to me, if you can just pray with me, if you can just read a scripture, read something positive, do something to come out of that space. And once you really get a morning routine set, you'll absolutely have a different life. That I know. This is almost 15 years of experience that I'm talking from. When you get that morning routine set, you're rocking and rolling because like you said, you know that you're capable of doing anything. Mm -hmm. My morning routine, I like to get up. I like to turn on something positive, inspirational. I go for a walk and I call it my gratitude walk. Because either I'm giving thanks for everything or I'm just listening to the sound of nature. But I'm grateful for that. And then I come back in as the spiritual or in motivational stuff is playing in the atmosphere. I do some stretching. Some days it's full yoga, but literally it's just to wake my body up. And all of this is after I made my bed up, right? And then I go into the day. I have my coffee and I ease into the day. But I do not check social media. I do not check my email. I have a prophetic word, a spiritual word that I get every day. I don't even read that until after I'm ready to have my coffee and start my day. Mm -hmm. Because to your point, once we get inside that device, everything that's in there waiting on us is going to be, it's going to come into our spirit. So it can be a bad email. It can be something crazy in your news feed. You can't let it in. You have to anchor in your day and do things that serve you well. So you know that you are capable to go forth and be a high performer, positive person for the rest of the day. Absolutely. And you know, it's, I think with, social and the internet it's pilfered our time in such a kind of creepy way right we're not really aware and then you kind of if you were to really kind of do an audit if you let it kind of run ragged 
it's stealing a lot of things from you all the time, right? And before you know it, you read about something that Trump did today or something that's happening in DC where you are or, you know, somebody, you know, another, there's a lot of things going on in the world that are very, very significant, but you interact with the world when you're ready is mm -hmm. key, right? So build yourself up. Unfortunately, there's, there's phenomenal things in the world but if we get defined by the negative, first of all, especially when you've coped with a loss, like you're talking about, it's almost like you're siphoning out before you're putting in the gas. You need to put in the yeah. gas first, right? Definitely. And so now with, with you, um, tell me how you translate that out to executive teams and how you use these, these, these lessons, which are significant for all of us, um, whether it's a downsizing, a merger, and you know, it's it's all it's all change, right? How do you work with teams to achieve the same kind of um, shifts? I let them know that their greatest asset is their workforce. And when I'm working with them, I listen first. I listen to the pain points of the organization. And a lot of times, if they don't know what their pain is, they just know the the byproduct of it, and it's oh, you know, we have low productivity. I have an absenteeism issue. So you're saying, you're talking about executives and how you applied the concepts that you've learned in your life. And you're just in the process of talking about some of the simple application things that you do with people. So share with me some of those things that you do. Um, the first thing is, is truly assessing the state of the organization. Um, it's, I like to do a discovery session, and in that assessment with the leadership team, I get clear on what they perceive the pain of the organization to be. Um, and it's really the same when I work with an individual. What's, what's hurting you right now? Where are you not happy? And in an organization, you find often that it's the low productivity, it's the absenteeism, it's low morale. Ultimately, your workforce is not being a high-performing workforce. Something, whether it's systems, whether it's processes, or, or whether it's teams that are not adequately um, assigned, that's keeping you from being excellent. Because all organizations really want to be excellent. And so we determine what is the same way I do with the individual, what the blockages are. I determine what the blockages are within the organizational flow. Every organization has a flow that from, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in higher education, whether it's the direct sales, whatever the case may be, there is a process that weaves within the organization. And oftentimes we put teams within that process without them fully understanding their respective role. And then the next layer behind that is, is this person well equipped by way of within themselves qualification? or by way of the resources that they need in this organization to be a high performer. So we go through that cycle and we do the assessment and then we start looking at the processes and then I make the recommendations or we collectively come up with recommendations on how we can do a test run. And I really focus on the test run because organizational change does not happen overnight. So if you let people know that we're in the process of improving our operation, we are in the process of implementing some techniques and some strategies to become a high-performing operation, they're more receptive to the change. Because change management is critical, and stress management is critical, and people like to do things the way they've always done it. And so when you have an outside consultant coming in, we as consultants have to be sure to meet our clients where they are, but ease them into the process of transformation. And it works exceptionally well, because when people reach out to me when um, the um, Executive leaders reach out to me. They are ready. They're at that point to do whatever is required and what it takes to really go from good to great. So you're looking at a platform. You're understanding the internal and external pressures. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're understanding the teams within that context. And then you're figuring out what are the you know, stop gaps or the blockages, like you said. And then you're strategically working individually with the teams and maybe even executive coaching to the individuals that have maybe have some conflict or skill deficits to kind of get everybody ready. And at the end, do you um, get everybody back together again? Do you do it collectively at the beginning, kind of do pre pre assessments, um, kind of get all the data, then deliver and then do a post kind of victory dance, I should say. 
Absolutely. And I like to do it broken down. I like to do it with the team and then just the executive leadership. So the executive leadership's perspective is always going to be different from what I call the boots on ground workforce. So I like to speak with both of them separately, whether it's um, in person, if it's somewhere locally, or I travel to them, or we do it virtually. And then we have a look back. And on the look back, we see based off that initial conversation, this is what's said to be the issue. Where are we right now? And it's always beautiful when you see statistically there's been an increase. If the organization is sales driven, it's always amazing to see they've increased their sales. They've decreased their absenteeism. You can, it, you know, morale, those soft skills are often hard to measure, but you can feel the impact of it. So when I have the small focus group of the team and they say I absolutely felt like coming to work today. I was more productive. I was able to take the list by the way of, by the way of I teach them how to categorize their to-do list so they can act on it. They get more done. So I do come back in and we look at it and we assess it. Then of course it's on the client, how long we want the relationship to last. A lot of times, you know, budget drives it, the need drives it, all that good stuff. But I always do a look back because, and you'll know this when you're working with individuals and organizations it's all about the value that i'm able to bring you and the results that you're able to see so i want to see that it's working and if not let's tweak it what do we need to do different it's the same right. way in life you know someone's going to listen to this and they're going to say oh if i make my bed in the morning i'm going to not be depressed <laughs> that may not be just what you need you may also need to make sure you sit outside and get some sunlight you may need to call your mother in the morning so it's going to be different but you have to do that test run let me try it taking that first step and trying something is more than sitting in the same place basking in complaints because that's easily done but it'll get you nowhere fast absolutely so some movement at all and adjusting accordingly based to what you're learning because there's always going to be um, ongoing variables that might impact the, the the finish line that quarter mile right <laughs> it's like what's what's tripping you guys up along the way and then getting to know people I would think a lot of times a lot of what happens is it's the element of trust and respect that gets lost when there's mm -hmm. changes and you know a lot of the higher level c-suite individuals may not recognize you know, that what small things are important to the boots on the ground kind of people, right? The boots on the ground kind of people want to feel, hey, I'm cared for, you know, I have a voice and what I do is going to make a difference, but let me know that in some way. The people at the C-suite may not recognize that something as simple as a, a hello in the morning or, you know, when you see someone in the cafeteria acknowledging them, basic little things like that, that disconnect often happens. I, I know you've probably seen it by, you know, you shake it up. And then before you know it, people that are connected, people don't leave jobs, they leave managers. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You, it's almost like you were inside one of my sessions, especially with the saying good morning. It's so many times I've heard team members say, my leader, my supervisor doesn't even speak to me. They come through the door with an attitude. And as beautiful as it is to say, oh, we're changing the culture of this organization, cultural change starts with the individual. That's like for my organization, the Academy, the A. Lewis Academy, my tagline is strong mind, strong organization. Because the mental strength is what's going to make the organization stronger. The mental strength of the individual, you cannot change collectively if each individual does not play their part and something as simple as a good morning something as simple as talking to someone outside of a work topic makes a huge difference because it's relationships it's a working relationship corporations are often with each other more than they're with their own families so let's get to know each other i'm not saying you know you don't need a best friend at work per se but you definitely don't need an enemy Oh, exactly. And you just need to know, you know, if you're my executive, I need to know that, hey, what she really like, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I know I have to work for you, but you know what she really like, what does she kind of do for fun or not that you need to share everything about your life, but the, the, the elements that I talk about in my brand, the authenticity that's needed so that I can know, you know what, April's just like me, right? Yeah. In so many ways. And she's a good person and, and she listens and she respects me. Oh, now she needs X, Y, Z done, which is like really, really lots for the next quarter. But you know what? She's got my back. I've got her back kind of thing. So it's, it really is, becomes an interplay um, that we all need, really, if you think about it. I, you know, I'm sure with you in the military, you, you know, um, 
got exposed to a lot of things, but at the end of the day, we really want to feel like we're making a difference in whatever capacity we're working. Absolutely. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. We are all human being and ultimately we're human becoming. We are becoming the better versions of ourselves each day. All of that starts with making a choice. You have to choose to want more, to do more, to be better. And then that transcends out into your life. It transcends through your team and it transcends through your corporation. When we take this big divide between the individual and the organization out, when we shrink that divide, that's where you have high performance because we are one. You are one person. And as that one person, yes, you may be a chief executive officer or yes, you may be a supervisor or yes, you may be, you know, a customer service representative for this bigger organization. So let's bring it in as close as we can and get on one accord with ourselves first, making sure we're in alignment with our truth. We're in positions that serve us well and we can perform well. And then we get on one accord with the organizational mission. And that is how you go from good to great. Yes, small to big. You start yes. small and then before you know it, you kind of get out of the way and the big takes care of itself. Uh, April, it's it's been a pleasure. I mean, uh, how you translate, you know, something that adverse. And I often say that adversity, you know, we have a choice. It, it sometimes doesn't feel like we have a choice. But, you know, my dad always says, you know, everything happens in this life for a reason. And, you know, as, as hard as it sounds like you lost, you know, um, someone so significant that you've taken that and you've, you've created a gift that you're, that's allowing you to teach people, you know, that worth starts with you. Bad things happen to all of us, unfortunately, in life, but it's kind of what you do with it, you know, that to make sense of it, that helps us to move on and then go out and help others. Because how many people, when you're on that stage that day, could relate? My goodness, like so many people have been through pain, have felt alone and um, wanted some reason to kind of take that step, but sometimes we're lost. So I, I could tell by the, what, what I'd seen when you touch people uh, that day on stage. Absolutely. Yes. We are all in this thing called life together. Pain does not discriminate. Hurt does not discriminate. Loss does not discriminate. It does not matter how much money you have, how much fame, how much recognition, how much education you have. Life is going to happen. The only thing that we have to worry about, focus our energy on, is how are we going to respond? That's it. Your response to life is what's going to make or break you in your performance and in your happiness. Wow. Couldn't have ended on a better note. So tell everyone um, where they can get a hold of you if people ever wanted to consult with you, um, if they wanted to invite you to speak at their organization. Um, you know, I know you're in the U.S., but we're always looking for great people up here, you know, to speak on these things. So why don't you share with everyone listening where they can get a hold of you? Absolutely. I am found at aprillewis.com. That's L-E-W-I-S. You can email me directly at april at aprillewis.com. I would love to come in and work with you as an individual, work with your team, whatever I can do to serve. I'm available as needed. Um, and that's true internationally as well. So aprillewis.com and you can connect with me there. Awesome. So thank you again, April, for spending this time for everyone. Getting connected is key, like I've said, you know, in my Authentic Living with Roxanne. So if you're interested in, in getting a little bit more connected with it, with it yourself or with your teams um, or just at work, uh, you can go to my website at roxanderhodge.com forward slash blueprint where you can get a free course on how to get more connected to yourself. So take care and we'll chat with you again soon. Take care, April. Thank you, Roxanne. Have a good one. Okay, bye. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.